I'd like to welcome em everybody here this evening. I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting this evening, the Yellowcoot Willem clan of the Bunurong peoples and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to also uh, respect the elders of the lands on which uh, many people are tuning in this evening. Uh, and I'd now like to pass over to Anna to begin proceedings for this evening. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'd too like to add my acknowledgement of country and as I adjust this microphone awkwardly. Um, uh, and I'm just dealing with some housekeeping very quickly before I hand over to the main event. I'd like to thank and welcome everyone for braving a chilly Melbourne night to get here and also welcome all of our, I think, 500 plus guests online. So thank you for making the effort to come here tonight to have this conversation. I'd like to start by acknowledging that this election, more than any, I think, in history, um, has brought our communities into the crosshairs in ways that just, we just couldn't have imagined uh, a few short weeks ago. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge the devastating impact of the last few weeks on our transgender women and our transgender girls in our community. It has been truly horrific uh, the way this has played out. And tonight is about moving away from that debate. Tonight is about having a conversation about the very real and pressing issues facing our communities and hearing from the major political parties about what policy offerings and commitments they have on the table to actually take us forward as communities. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Patricia Carvelis for hosting us and moderating the discussion, kindly agreeing to bring her independence and journalistic rigour uh, that we're all familiar with on a, on a morning um, to the event here tonight. Um, the event is being filmed. Um, please turn your phones off or on silent. Um, I am aware also this will bring up, potentially bring up issues for people, so we will have the details of QLife um, on the screen for those that need them. Um, and I'm sure many of you in the community are involved um, in supporting the community and well aware of the good work that QLife does. Um, please join us in the conversation. So if you're tweeting, use the hashtag EqualityVotes and um, the tweets will be uh, featured on the on the broadcast as we move along in the evening. Um, but that's all from me. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Patricia and to kick things off. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And I too would like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land where we stand, uh, their elders past, present and emerging, and to have a kind of broader think about uh, the intersectional issues too. Um, we are all beneficiaries, uh, I think, of being on this land. Um, and um, that's come at a price to many people and, and the ongoing struggle that they go through. Look, I said yes to doing this election forum because I think debates um, and discussions uh, that are focused on particular communities and minority communities like the LGBTIQ plus community should be conducted where people can ask questions of political leaders to find out where the political parties stand on these things. And so it is in that context that I'd like to welcome um, the very um, excellent people on the panel. Uh, I know them all personally and I can tell you they are all very, very um, passionate politicians. Uh, Janet Rice of the Greens, Penny Wong, um, who needs no introduction of the Labor Party, and of course, Senator Andrew Bragg, New South Wales Liberal. Hello, Senator Andrew Bragg, who joins us on screen. Now, there are very specific questions we're going to come to tonight from community members who have very, very um, specific questions and I have some follow-ups too. But before we get into that, I think it's really important that all of the people here are able to provide uh, their opening statements about, uh, you know, where they see their party positioning on these issues. And we'll start with you, Janet Rice. Oh, okay. Well, you're right next to me. Why? Why not? No, so no hierarchies. <laughs> I'm just going with who's and right next to me. And I don't quite know where to stand, but welcome. That's a great spot. Yeah, I think it's a great spot too. Yes, look, I did, like want, Oprah. To, did want to start by acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Bunurong people and pay my respects to their elders and to all First Nations peoples, including any who are with us here today, and to commit ourselves that we need to be working for justice. We need to be working for treaties with our First Nations peoples. With regards to tonight and LGBTIQA plus um, equality 
The Greens reckon it is time to reach equality now. We have, I'm fed up with being on this journey to equality. We need to reach it now. We launched our Equality Now platform for this election here at the Pride Centre just a week ago. And there are some, there's a lot in it, but some of the key things that re we're really committed to are having a Minister for Equality and a LGBTIQA plus Commissioner in the Human Rights Commission and having a government that will put equality for LGBTIQA plus people at the centre of our governance, that really cares, that works with communities, that shares power with those communities in order to achieve equality across the huge range of portfolios that our rights um, intersect with. We want to see an end to all discrimination on the basis of gender and sexuality. We have still got discrimination in our Sex Discrimination Act. We obviously saw the Liberal Party with their religious discrimination bill that was going to increase discrimination. We want to get rid of it. We want, do not want to have LGBTIQA plus kids discriminated in schools, their teachers discriminated against, other people like people turning up at a homelessness shelter running by a faith-based charity being turned around. All of those things are still legal under our existing anti-discrimination laws. And we want to really invest in LGBTIQA plus health. And so we've got a commitment to spending $265 million, I think it is, over the forward estimates on our health and wellbeing strategy that would really address the issues of LGBTIQA plus health across the gamut of it and, and extra funding for mental health. And we know the traumas that we have been through, so many of us, over a pretty tough few years. And we, we need to be investing in health and wellbeing and so that we can be really celebrating and really fulfilling the health of all of our queer communities. So I'm really proud to be here tonight, really proud to be the only openly bi plus politician in the country, as far as I know, out um, bi plus politician. And I'm committed to you that the Greens, if we get to a position of kicking out the Morrison government, that we would support an incoming Labor government, push an incoming Labor government to go further and faster on issues of equality so that we can really get to the end of our journey to equality. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Yeah. Now, we will um, move to our other speakers in a moment, but it's time for our welcome to country. Unfortunately, it was slightly delayed. Um, I, uh, we, of course, tried to acknowledge the land where we are, but uh, that is not a welcome to country. So please welcome our speaker, who I believe is imminently coming into the room. <laughs> and I'm very good at filling time. So... Um, uh, I'm trying to not, not make inappropriate yeah. jokes, Penny. I know, I know. I was, I was looking at it. Oh, where's she going? Interesting. <laughs> Patricia's bored. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks, David. I'm so sorry for being late, guys. Um, yeah, my apologies. All right, woman Jika, I'd like to pay my respects to our ancestors and elders past, present and emerging and to re respectfully recognise the trauma, sacrifice and displacement our ancestors and elders <coughs> have experienced. <clears throat> I also want to recognise the commitment you are making today by engaging <clears throat> in one of the oldest continuing practising ceremonies in this country by paying respects to the spirit of this land and its first people. Through this, you have shown the willingness to honour sacred ground that we all walk on. As a descendant of Melbourne's first people, the Buddharong people of the great southeastern Kulin nations, I'm pleased to be able to welcome you here today on behalf of Papa Nata Caroline Briggs AM. Despite all the you know, buildings and concrete and asphalt and all that sort of stuff, you are standing on the traditional country of the Bunurong people, who are one of the five language groups that make up the southeastern Kulin nations, which covers central Victoria at the time of first European contact. These mobs being the Bunurong, the Wurundjeri, the Tanurong, the Jarjarung, and the Wadarung. 
our country now consists of a great multicultural city we know as Melbourne, the importance of our land and our culture, the spirit of Bunjil, our creator, and his gifts of generosity still influence this land and the people today. What we have learned from our ancestors passed down through generations still resonate with us. These include the core values of learning, showing respect, celebrating life and honouring sacred ground. As Australians, whilst we come from different clans, language groups and even countries across the world, we can all learn from these core values. The word welcome in Bunurong language is womanjika, but it translates to come with purpose. It's also a spoken contract between the Bunurong people as the custodians of this country and yourselves to ensure our laws are adhered to and to guarantee safe passage for those who ask. According to tradition, this land has always been protected by our creator Bunjil, who travels as a wedge-tailed eagle, and by Wa, who protects the waterways and travels as a crow. Uh, Bunjil taught the Bunurong people to always welcome guests, but requires us to ask all visitors to make two promises, which I've asked you today, to obey the laws of Bunjil and to not harm their children or the land of Bunjil. This commit was made through exchange of a small bow dipped in water and the spoken words, woman jika. So woman jika, merm, bik bik, bunurong, nam, derp, barapan, atha wulam. Come with purpose, my beautiful home, the land of the two bays. This is Bunurong country. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we, we appreciate that. Look, it's time to welcome uh, the leader of the Labor Party in the Senate and the Shadow Foreign Minister, Editor Pibong. I think I'm on this mic, so I'll move this one away. Yep, no worries. Uh, thanks very much. Can I thank David Tunier for the generous welcome to country? Uh, acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Bunurong people, acknowledge the First Nations. Uh, of all of the places from which people are joining us online and say to you, uh, there are many reasons why I'd like us to win government. <laughs> but actually first amongst them uh, is to have a government that gives full faith in ex uh, delivery to the Uluru Statement from the heart. <laughs> so elections are always a choice about what sort of country you want uh, and what I'd say to you is this election is uh, a choice between a better future and more of the same. And importantly for our community, it's a choice between a leader whose reflex is division, whose reflex is to set people apart, uh, and an Albanese Labor government which wants to bring people together. Uh, and as I move around the country, and I've travelled a fair bit over the last few weeks, I think Australians are ready for a leader who brings people together. Uh, Labor governments have had a long history, a long and proud history of advancing equality for all Australians. That would continue if we were elected. Uh, I would like to announce tonight that we uh, have made an election commitment of $5.9 million to AFAO, the Federation of Aid Organisations, and NAPWA, the Associ National Association of People with HIV Australia, both of which had their funding cut by the Morrison government, and if elected, we would restore that funding. Uh, in addition, uh, I know how important QLife is to the community uh, and how vulnerable our community has been, uh, so I'm pleased to also announce that an Albanese Labor government would uh, provide a one-off grant to boost QLife's peer support workforce so that more LGBTIQ plus Australians can be reached in their time of need. Uh, and finally, uh, we do need to make sure that we continue to work with and empower the community in decisions that impact our community. Uh, and we will provide one-off grants to LGBTIQ plus Health Australia and AFAO to lead engagement and consultation with the community and the Department of Health. So I'm pleased that we've managed to um, 
work with the organisations for some uh, of those three announcements. I think more broadly I want to say this. I've been in Parliament now 20 years. I've seen uh, us make many advances and I've seen some pretty awful debates. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the, the courage uh, and care of the community, of our community. Uh, and I want to say this to you. I wish it were easier, but the fact is equality has never come really easily. It always has to be fought for. It always has to be won. And what I ask you is on the 21st of May to take the next step in that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, uh, Liberal New South Wales uh, Senator Andrew Bragg, you can't come to the lectern, but please take it away. Uh, thanks, PK. And uh, thanks, David, for that welcome. And I'll make an acknowledgement of country as well. And I'd like to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues, uh, Penny and Janet, um, and acknowledge their personal efforts uh, on these important issues over the, a long period of time. Look, um, one of the most, and I'm, I'm going to spare you any sort of political talking points tonight because I know that people are tired of all that um, as this election drags on. Um, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a believer in, in a form of liberalism which I call live and let live. Uh, and I think it's very important that we go out of our way to support individuals um, in the choices that they make in their lives. Um, I, I would say to you that it's also, though, equally important that we do step in and support minority communities uh, with funding uh, and other support that is required because I think the mark of a good society is how it treats a minority group. And I want to recognise that I know that there have been times, including in the recent past, where it's been very difficult to be um, in the LGBTI community and more broadly, and I regret that very much. Uh, and it's very important that people know that there is a lot of support uh, for that community. Um, and over the course of uh, this period of, of government, and people like Maurice Payne um, have gone out of their way to put uh, the human rights agenda of LGBTI uh, on the global stage uh, at a very, very, as, as a very high priority. So um, tonight, um, I'm announcing that the government is supporting the community with an additional $4.3 million in mental health funding, which is going to uh, support the, um, the I'm just trying to find my piece of paper here, the, it's going to support the uh, LGBTI uh, health organisation um, with a range of programs and I can provide that material directly. Uh, but I also wanted to make the point that um, from a personal point of view, I mean, I've tried to work as much as I could uh, with the equality organisation over a long period of time. And I'd like to also acknowledge Anna Brown and, uh, and her colleagues at Equality because I think you do a great job in representing uh, the issues of your community, uh, whether it be on marriage equality or whether it has been um, through the, the debate we had on the religious discrimination bill where I provided a uh, additional comments uh, on the legislation um, as part of my role as a senator. So, look, um, um, I would like to hear a couple of things tonight, if it's possible, because I think it's better if this is a two-way discussion rather than just listening to politicians bang on about their talking points. Um, we have made significant investments in the mental health uh, component of the LGBTI community. So I would like to know um, how effective you think those programs are and whether we are using the right providers or whether there are other organisations that we should be looking at. And equally, um, it would be a good opportunity to get an update on, on what are the most important federal issues uh, in that equality space that we should try and address in the next term of parliament. Because there are a lot of issues that we're going to discuss tonight, which are state issues and they're important issues. And I'm happy to give my open and honest views on them, but it would be good to get some feedback on those two things. So I just wanted to thank you very much for having me tonight and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, no. Um, first question is from Michelle McNamara. Ma Michelle, make your way to the lectern if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, and um, thank you, Senators, for being here tonight. 
I'm Michelle McNamara. I'm the treasurer of Transgender Victoria and an out and proud transgender woman. There's been a lot of uh, coverage this election campaign over attempts to exclude trans and, gen and gender diverse women and girls from sports, from playing sports in teams where they belong and are loved. The bill that Senator Chandler has proposed is really unnecessary and divisive. And the frankly offensive discussions that have come around it have caused immense trauma in the trans and gender diverse community. So my questions are twofold. Will your party rule out support for this bill if it ever comes to the, um, the Senate or the House? And what will your party do to address the very real issues that face the trans and gender diverse community? Principally, the physical and funding, the physical and mental health care that's needed for those, those people and in particular, the life-saving, gender-affirming health care, um, uh, gender-confirming and affirming health care that is so desperately needed by this community. Thank you. Um, Senator Bragg, given uh, it's certainly not your bill, but it is a bill that's come from your side of politics, so I will put that question to you. Okay, well, look, um, thank you very much for your question. And as I said, uh, I'm sorry that there has been um, so much discussion about these issues during an election campaign. I don't think it's in anyone's interest uh, for these issues to be pushed into the heat of an election campaign. I'm acutely aware of uh, how vulnerable the trans community is. And as I say, it's uh, hugely regrettable. Um, I would say as a legislator, I mean, if someone wants to put forward a private senator's bill, which is what it is, it's not a government bill, uh, then the first thing uh, that should happen is that bill should go to an inquiry where the, you can gather evidence. And my sense is that the evidence would be that the law as it stands is already strong uh, and that it allows community-based sporting organisations and national sporting organisations to make their own judgments and they can exclude people based on strength, stamina and physique. So the law is already strong. Uh, so I think that the test would be uh, easier a need for there to be a change in the law. And I would say so far, the evidence uh, has not come in, uh, but I think to do our jobs properly, we need to go through that process of having a Senate inquiry. But as I say, I understand it's been an acutely difficult period and I regret that very much. Senator Wong? Are we sharing? Sharing is caring. Well, where to start? Uh, I respect that uh, Andrew is not one of the people doing this, so, but I would say to you, this is ultimately actually not about the policy. We all know that. So you ask decent policy questions, but this is about a political tactic. Uh, in the same way as we saw some of the religious discrimination bill used in that way, and it's about um, you know, Mr Morrison's reflex to weaponise certain issues as a way of dividing the community. Uh, and I actually find it, and I'm, I know this must be even more so for many people in the, in what, who are transgender, who identify in that community, I, I find it actually really quite distressing. Um, you know, I have a couple of kids in my life not my children, but friends of the family. And, you know, this is a hard time for them. They're trying to work out who they are. And they hear this. Um, and I can, I could sort of understand, you know, like I, there are people of faith, there are people with very deeply held views, there are people for whom, you know, they are still, this is a still a learning process for them. I could understand if there was, um, you know, People were on that journey, but it's not about that, is it? It is, and there's something um, really um, deeply wrong where a political leader can target kids who are vulnerable, who are more likely, at, we know, to self-harm in an attempt to play a political identity card. So. Uh, 
I uh, acknowledge Andrew's intervention and others in the Liberal Party. I wish that there more of them were able to stop this. Uh, and you know, I just keep talking about this not this ought not be an issue weaponised in an election campaign because it shouldn't be in a decent country. The attacks on trans women and the attacks absolutely completely undermining the identity of trans people, gender diverse and non-binary people has just been appalling through this election campaign. And to have a pre-selected liberal candidate to be fanning the flames of that transphobia, I just it's been a really very sad moment in Australian political history. Um, and to be in the Senate and to hear openly transphobic, really dangerous and divisive um, speeches regularly by some of those Liberal senators is also incredibly distressing. Um, the Greens, you know, have been absolutely committed to ending all discrimination against trans and gender diverse and non-binary people. Certainly the legislation that's being proposed by Claire Chandler, I mean, it should not be seeing the light of day. And if it, if it comes back, well, I just, it just shows you that the Liberals basically are not willing to call out that transphobia. Their party should be calling that out completely if they have got any um, sense of the rights and, and the health and the well-being of trans and gender diverse people. What you do about it from here, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a debate, it's an attack. And we certainly over the last couple of weeks have really struggled with how much you respond to it or how much that's just inflaming these attacks. But, I mean, there are a number of things. And one is actually ending all discrimination in our laws against trans, gender diverse and non-binary people. And that discrimination still exists. It ex exists in the name of religion, in the discrimination that's allowed in schools and discrimination that's allowed in other institutions. We need to get rid of it because that is adding to the stigma. It's basically continuing just this setting trans, gender diverse and non-binary people as a part, as different and able to be discriminated against. And that really just discrimination has got to go. We do need to be doing things like supporting gender affirming health care. And the Greens, we, and as part of our platform, we've got a commitment to be, to be a fund of $15 million a, um, a year so that anybody um, accessing gender affirming health care would not have any out-of-pocket costs. And, and we need to be so generally supporting um, the trans community and doing everything we can, certainly um, access to mental health. And so our, you know, our mental health policy is to include all mental health under Medicare. So people who are struggling because of the discrimination and stig stigma with their mental health are able to access whatever mental health treatment they need at no cost. These are some of the things that are needed. And generally having um, spending resources and spending money, which we've got a commitment to do, supporting all organisations who are advocating for trans and gender diverse people and we've got a, a fund of $70 million to be supporting community organisations to make sure that this discrimination ends. Thank you. Okay, Amy, take it away. Thanks. My name is Amy Spencer and I work for the Independent Education Union. Our union represents teachers and support staff from faith-based schools. Um, many of our members are people of faith and are also part of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we often hear stories of their experience of discrimination in the workplace, such as losing their job, simply because of who they are or who they love. I've got two questions. One, what will your party do to protect LGBTQ plus people from being fired, expelled or otherwise discriminated against uh, should you be elected? And second, will you commit to ensuring that any future legal protections for people of faith such as the religious discrimination bill proposed by the Morrison government, will not override or come at the expense of protections for LGBTIQ plus people. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Senator Bragg, I'd like you to address that question because I know it's become um, quite a big one in your political party. Thanks, Amy, for that question. Um, the answer to the question is that uh, teachers and students in school shouldn't face discrimination and I think there is clear evidence that far too many gay teachers have been sacked, including people that I know, and I think that's just a small sample, frankly. I think that there are other people that uh, conceal their true 
identity and do other things, uh, which is, again, very regrettable. So, look, too many people have been sacked from schools, and that's why it's essential that we do revisit the issues on, uh, on teachers as well as, as students in the next parliament. Now, there will be an ALRC uh, Law, Law Reform Commission review into these matters, and it's very important that we get the benefit of that before we, we proceed. Uh, but look, I don't think that the drafting is all that complicated. I think, think some people have tried to make it look harder than it needs to be. The principle is uh, you shouldn't be sacked if you're, if you're gay. I mean, you wouldn't be sacked if you were black, to be frank. So I think that's a very important principle and we want to achieve that in the next parliament. Look, I've been told I'm allowed to ask um, follow-up questions, so I will, Senator Bragg. Um, you're... Oh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's the only reason I agreed. Senator Bragg, the question is this. Yeah. Um, you say that, but actually, you know, it, the, the focus of the Wentworth by-election where this was first promised was to remove discrimination mm. on gay students. students. Teachers yep. were not mentioned by uh, your government and even on the gay students that hasn't been honoured. So the question is have you ditched that promise? Because the Wentworth by-election was some time ago. Well no, it hasn't been ditched and in fact the commitment on students was affirmed earlier this year. I think it needs to be broadened uh, to deal with all students and certainly in terms of teachers that is before the a ALRC. So uh, once we get the ALRC report in, uh, there will be a strong push to get that done. It's very important. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but as you know, sometimes it's difficult to get things done in Canberra. Yes, I've noticed. Um, Senator Wong, um, <laughs> could you address that question? Uh, I'm glad you brought up the Wentworth by-election because it is useful to remember how long the uh, promise to protect kids has been around for. Uh, and... Um, <clears throat> In fact, we, we did get that amendment up on the religious discrimination bill in, in relation to children, as you might recall, which was one of the reasons why the Prime Minister Morrison then rejected it. Uh, I would say two things. You know, we're, we're a party of government that, that seeks to speak to Australians from all walks of life, including people of faith. And I, I think there, are, there was a way to have a conversation um, respectfully between different perspectives on relation to the relig religious discrimination bill because the principles are reasonably clear. People ought not be vilified for their religion and people ought not be vilified or discriminated against because of who they are. It's a reasonably simple set of propositions. Um, again, I think this is an issue that did get weaponised and became very divisive um, because of the way Mr Morrison wanted to approach it. Um, the, We've made our position clear. We've said we do support um, protections against religious vilification. Uh, we do support protections for students against discrimination. Uh, and we do support protections for teachers from discrimination at work. We have, and to be completely frank, we've, but we have said we respect the rights of uh, religious schools to preference people of faith in the selection of staff. And we, we've been upfront about that. And that's, that, that has been how we've approached this. You know, I was part of a government that, for the first time, put protections for people's sexual orientation uh, into the Sex Discrimination Act. Is that 2011? Um, and I think we did it before that, didn't we? Anyway, <laughs> you might be right. Um, you know, I think we can make similar progress here. Um, but we have to do it uh, in a way that... Well, I don't think the Liberal Party, with all due respect to Andrew, I don't think that, that they will ever, um, well, certainly while Mr Morrison leads them, uh, are going to be able to do it in a way that doesn't become highly weaponised. Um, now, I'm going to start being a bit of a timekeeper, I've got to say, because in order to... No, no, and it wasn't a specific comment on you, Senator Wong, everyone. Um, so let's just try and keep okay. things, you know, tight. All right. Well, my answer is pretty tight. We need to get rid of the exempt exemptions that are in Section 38 of the Sex Discrimination Act. Full stop. Get rid of them. And and allow people to be able to be who they are at school, whether they are students or whether they are teachers. And the fact that this is... <laughs> 
The fact that this is possible, even, and I know many, many people of faith that support this position, the real world example of why this isn't going to cause the sky to fall in for religious institutions and people of faith is Tasmania. Because Tasmania ha has had legislation for over 20 years that has not allowed discrimination against students or teachers in schools on the basis of their gender identity or sexuality. And the religious schools in Tasmania have coped with that just fine. And that's how it should be in the rest of the country. And it should be happening immediately. We, n we need to get rid of that discrimination. Certainly the religious discrimination bill was going to increase the grounds for discrimination, which is why I was really disappointed that the Labor Party actually voted for it in the House of Representatives when it was introduced. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Senator Bragg, I do have a follow-up question before we bring the next person up, which is just on the statement of belief. Um, are you concerned about the statement of belief in the Religious Discrimination well, Act? I feel like this is a, uh, pre, a, a premeditated question or something. I don't know. Um, um, look, I mean, I... No, it's the most obvious question about the bill. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think, as you know, I, I published a separate report in the Senate inquiry which dealt with this in detail, and I think that there are some issues with the statement of belief, uh, and those issues would need to, would need to be addressed uh, if it was to be progressed in any way. I think everyone accepts the principle of having a religious discrimination bill. I mean, every mainstream person accepts that there are areas in public life where religious people have been discriminated against and we need to fix that. So the question is, uh, what does it need? What are the essential components? And I'm not sure that's an essential component. Um, next question is from Matthew. My name is Matthew. I grew up in a loving family in a tight knit religious community. Um, like many LGBTQ kids growing up, uh, at the time I needed at the most to hear messages of support and acceptance at school, at home and at church. Um, and instead, I heard that I was broken, disordered, and under the control of evil spirits. When I reached out for help, the support that I received didn't seek to support me. It sought to change who I was. Um, and it was very damaging. If elected, what would you do um, to end these damaging practices, damaging conversion practices, that seek to change and suppress who we are? Um, sorry? Conversion therapy is yeah, at the, the heart of the question. Uh, Senator Russ, we'll begin with you. We can mix up the order. OK. Um, essentially, we support the legislation such as has been introduced in Victoria to end conversion practices um, because they are so damaging. Um, we feel that there should be a national approach. We've actually got legislation in different states which is of different um, levels of appropriateness and, and different strengths in ending conversion practices. The Victorian one was developed with the um, Conversion Practice Survivors Group um, Brave and the other, other groups and is really the legislation that should be adopted across the country. And we would want to... We certainly have got a commitment for funding a sort of national leadership role that the Fed, the Fed should be taking to actually make sure that we've got legislation right across the country to end conversion practices. Thank you. Senator Wong? Look, generally this has, I mean, I think state, the State Labor Government in Victoria has made clear, has dealt with this, as, as Janet said. It has generally been uh, a matter for state governments. Can, well, I should start by saying, Matthew, I'm sorry that, you know, your journey has been so difficult and, there was, and so damaging, as you said. Um, and uh, I hope you're in a much better place in your life now. That's a good thing. Um, uh, generally, uh, this has been a matter for the states. Uh, I am familiar, obviously, through um, um, engagement with various advocacy groups uh, with the, some of what has occurred in Victoria. We do have a national platform commitment that says we oppose it. Um, that is the platform position. But in terms of legislation, I think the view has been that this is a matter for state Labor governments. And Senator Bragg. Uh, well, the state Liberal government of New South Wales has flagged that it would consider supporting a similar bill in New South Wales, and that is something that I know that uh, Mark Couray has been appointed by Premier Perrottet 
to look at these issues is is examining. There's also a private members bill currently before the, the state parliament, which looks at this in a range of other things. So um, I think moving in a sensible direction there in the premier state. Can, can I add, I just found very my notes. Briefly, yes. Very briefly, very briefly, Doc. <laughs> Senator Rice. That, that we would commit to $125 million to fund the approach recommended in the sexual orientation and gender identity change okay. if it's survivor statement, so right. including a national inquiry. Okay. Dr Alice de Jong is our next uh, questioner. My name's Alice and I'm from the Board of Intersex Human Rights Australia. I was 13 when I was diagnosed with an intersex condition. For many Australians born with innate characteristic variations of sex characteristics are subjected to so-called normalising medical interventions, surgical and medical, without their personal consent at a much earlier age. What will your government do to prevent such unnecessary procedures and support intersex Australians and their families? So, Senator Rice, um, you can take that one. Do you think that there needs to be legislation? In Absolutely. Area? There needs to be national legislation to make sure that surgery without consent is not undertaken for these so-called normalising procedures. There's been a massive amount of work done by the intersex organisations, particularly the Intersex Human Rights As Association and intersex advocates across the country a um, number of years ago now, and they prepared the Darlington Statement, which outlines everything that needs to occur. And in our platform, we are committed to... We would spend $132 million over the next four years to implement the Darlington Statement, which would basically work with funding for the, for the public service, working to get that nationally consistent legislative approach up, um, $3 million a year for additional funding to better understand and support the needs of people with intersex variations, funding for the community organisations to support advocacy and peer support, and another $4 million a year for additional funding for the education of health, welfare and allied professionals in issues regarding people with intersex variations. Thank you. Senator Wong? Uh, we have a platform commitment uh, in general terms about the develop to supporting your org uh, intersex-led organisations to provide support to intersex persons and their families and to advocate on intersex issues. The, we, we have um, uh, funded, as I announced tonight, a consult consultation for the broader LGBTIQ plus community. Um, uh, uh, I'll be frank, it, uh, I, I'm not as familiar as Janet is with uh, the work your community has done. Uh, it might be good to grab you afterwards because I would have thought some of the existing medical requirements around consent, um, as they have been modernised over the years, um, should uh, at least ensure that people are not put in the position that you describe. Um, so I'm trying to look at you. Uh, <laughs> you describe uh, as having been pressured to behave in a certain way um, or to to have certain um, uh, health advice provided to you at an age of 13. So I would have thought that that should be dealt with. So I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Senator Bragg, it does seem like one of those um, issues that actually politicians are probably just not aware of enough. Do you think there needs to be some some reform and research in this area, given mm. that clearly the parliament's n not up to date on it? Uh, there has been a Human Rights Commission inquiry that has looked at some of these matters and that reported to the Attorney General at the end of last year and that has recommended that there be a, a panel established uh, to make, uh, to provide advice about how these judgments are made. And so there's more, more oversight uh, and frankly, integrity in how this is undertaken. Uh, and I will be raising this with the Attorney General. Uh, if we are returning to government, we need to give a proper response to this you know, within the first few months. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a pretty interesting answer actually. Um, Nikki Bath is our next person who's going to be asking a question. Put this up 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm Nikki Bath. I'm the CEO of LGBTIQ Plus Health Australia, and it's just wonderful to see you all here today and to know that everyone's there online. Uh, LGBTIQ plus people have been identified as priority populations in a range of existing national strategies. However, there's a, currently a real lack of national coordination of those goals, strategies and evaluation of those um, strategies, despite evidence um, of continued and worsening health and wellbeing outcomes. Can you please explain your party's commitments to investing in a long-term plan? LHA is asking for a 10-year um, action plan that will give us a whole of government plan to improve LGBTIQ plus health and wellbeing and to reduce the health disparities that are continuing to worsen. Thank you. Senator Bragg, I'm going to start with you. Sorry, yeah. Senator. Uh, well, thanks, Nikki. Well, I think, as I said in my opening statement, we are going to provide your organisation with 3.7 million of the new 4.2 million that's been announced today uh, to undertake a lot more research, particularly on the mental health side, uh, and to get some better data uh, across the board. So um, my hope is that that additional uh, $3.7 million for these four projects that you've been wanting to have funded will go some way, and anything beyond that, it's something that I can take up uh, internally. Senator Wong? Uh, well, just to say, um, uh, I think we have announced a one-off grant uh, for consultation process purposes on the very issue you described, which is what is the experience of the LGBTIQ plus community? How, how could we look at the health system differently? So I think when talking to Mark Butler about this, his view was well, we should have a, 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 a Commonwealth supported consultation process uh, to work out how to develop the sort of strategy you just, sorry, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> strategy described, um, which is, yeah, I suppose more holistic across different different sectors of 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 health, state and federal. Um, we, I've worked closely with the LGBTIQA plus Health Alliance and other health advocates, and health and well-being of LGBTIQA plus people is of absolute absolute paramount importance. We costed. We basically took the requests not just for the development of an overarching health and wellbeing plan, but what it would cost to implement that health and wellbeing plan over first over the next four years and over the next 10 years to the Parliamentary Budget Office. And they came back and basically said it would be at least $200 million. So we have committed in our, our platform to uh, $285 million to be implementing, to be developing and implementing an LGBTI QA plus health and wellbeing plan. And that plan needs to be front and central to a lot of the work that goes on with queer communities across Australia and be one of the things that our Minister for Equality would actually have carriage of. Because, yes, most of it fits into health, but health and wellbeing for LGBTIQA plus people crosses across portfolios and it really needs to have a focus and an intent and a commitment to be really working across those portfolios to make sure that the health and wellbeing needs of LGBTIQA plus people are really prioritised. Our next question is from Ricky Spencer. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ricky Spencer. My pronouns are they and her. I am a proud trans woman with a disability, a qualified primary school and secondary teacher and religious education accredited. Just on that note, um, I'm somebody who can't get work in a Victorian school. Every time I'm looked at, um, they say thanks, but no thanks. So, so much for our discrimination laws. Hey, um, I'm also a research student. I'm a community worker. And most importantly, I'm from the stolen generation. So I'd like to acknowledge any other mob here. Pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging. My question is as follows. A disproportionate number of LGBTIQ people experience poorer health outcomes and have higher risks of suicide compared with broader populations. Rates of self-harm and suicide 
are particularly high amongst trans and gender diverse people and the First Nations people. How will you improve mental health and reduce suicide amongst LGBTIQ people? Will your party fund LGBTIQ plus community controlled organisations to engage with the National Suicide Prevention Office to get results? Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. <laughs> Senator Bragg. Well, thanks, Ricky, for that question. Um, I, I mean, you did touch on something that I raised in my opening remarks, which is that there are significant funding pledges from, from us and from the Labor Party, uh, and it, it would be good to get some feedback about how those organisations are going, because the Commonwealth Government is committed to funding mental health services in this community, and I think that is a bipartisan commitment that you have before you tonight. The question is, are the organisations that we are funding, are they doing a good enough job? Uh, because in the past few years, we've put $7 million into Q Life, a couple of million into Mind Out, another seven into Q Headspace, and I've announced tonight another $4 million uh, to go to LHA. So uh, um, the, the question is, um, um, how are those services serving, serving the community? Um, are there different things that we could, could do uh, differently or better? I guess that's an ongoing ongoing um, discussion that we, we could have. But I think it, this isn't a question about money. It's a question of uh, are the services delivering enough for the community? Mm. Senator Wong. Uh, well, we've uh, I've made some announcements tonight about which which go to some of those issues but can I just make a broader point about um, about this uh, I think one uh, not only specialized mental health services but also uh, making sure you have mental health services that young people can access so in fact I announced another headspace um, center for South Melbourne today with Josh Josh Burns. Uh, secondly, uh, we can have the discussion about what, where and how, you know, how to resource, best models of care, etc. But in part, what we also have to try and uh, generate, I think, is a more inclusive national conversation in our political life. Uh, so people don't feel so marginalised and targeted and unsafe. Um, it's been a privilege to me to um, represent this community for many years. And, and one of the really striking things for me uh, has been the number of young people who come up to me and tell me what a difference it made. I'm not, it's, it's not about me, it's about them, right? Um, but it's because they didn't feel alone. Uh, so we should never forget the responsibility and power that leaders, national leaders, people in the media, community leaders, health leaders, that we have. Because how we speak about people's place in this world, in this society, how we speak about inclusion or exclusion, it has, a, it has an impact. So yes, Funding, I'm sure Janet will announce more funding she never has to fund the money for. <laughs> As a former finance minister. But we could do all that. It was light-hearted. <laughs> We've been very... But, uh, we are in a political campaign, I yeah, no, no, it's, uh, no, it's, I mean, I think it's been a, it's been a, a pretty respectful discussion tonight, actually. Um, you know, but I, I, I would like to not have to defend, uh, as we have over the years, who we are, who we love, or now, trans kids. That'd be good, wouldn't it? It'd be good if we could just work through these things, as generally the community do. This is the thing that, whether it's marriage equality on the most recent issue of trans women, trans girls, actually the community's ahead of where the politicians are, well, some politicians. 
Um, so I guess I'd want to I'd want to encourage that. And if I, may I make one more comment? I'm sorry to to do this, but <clears throat> I come to this with an experience of you know racism and the history of racism in this country and the history, which was, is still a journey and still a task and still. A, a, but you know, knowing that. Historically, some of the great advances, whether it's the abolition of the White Australia policy or the introduction of the Racial Discrimination Act, were bipartisan. Yeah, and the safety of that, that both parties of both parties of government said, actually, we agree this. And when Fraser Anning did his um, dreadful speech to the parliament, I actually rang Matthias Cormann and I said, we should move this censure together because it sends a signal I would like that signal sent for our community. Senator, Senator Russ. Yeah, and fundamentally we do need to get rid of the stigma, the discrimination against same-sex attracted and gender diverse people so that some trans people walking down the street don't expect to be harassed, which there are so many trans people and, and, and non-binary people, gender diverse people who are, you know, Basically, their expectation is they don't feel safe out in public, and that is appalling in Australia today. So we've got to, you know, really address getting rid of that discrimination, getting rid of the conversion practices to create a society and a community and a culture where everybody um, is celebrated. That's the fundamental thing we've got to do. Sadly, we are not in that situation at the moment, and so we know as a result the mental health of um, same-sex attracted and gender diverse people is worse than the, the health of the overall Australian community. First of all, the, one of the things we've got to do is actually get good statistics and count people and collect the data and actually... <laughs> So, yeah, and have the census question so that we know that when you are looking at mental health statistics, you know how many people have got that correlation of their mental health with their gender identity or their, their sexual orientation. And then we've got to spend the money and put in place the structures and the resources so that everybody can receive the mental health care that they need, mm. no matter whether they live here in Melbourne or they live out in Whoop Whoop in, you know, remote Australia. They need to be able to get the mental health care they need. And that does cost money, and frankly it does, and that's, again, the Greens, yes, we've got our, our LGBTIQA plus health plan, which is dealing with specifically mental health services included in that. But generally, getting mental health treatment available for people, unlimited, under Medicare, is essential. Okay. And that costs money. I mean, we, again, we've had that costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office of about $4.8 billion over the forwards. It is absolutely money that needs to be spent. And how we raise the money, you make the big end of town, you make the billionaires, you make the, the companies that are making huge profits pay more tax. You scrap the stage three tax cuts so that you mean the budget bottom line isn't impacted by... Um, a reduction of $180 billion over the next 10 years. The money's there. It's a political choice okay. of whether we spend it. All right. Let's, let's stick to um, our next question, Nick Hollis. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Hollis, uh, and I've been living with HIV now for nearly 10 years, uh, which um, I guess it's important to note that if I wasn't able to access uh, the treatments that... Uh, freely available here in Australia, but not elsewhere, um, I wouldn't be here anymore um, around this time. Um, what is, that's, that's not very nice, that's not good news, um, unless you don't like me. Um, but it's, um, <laughs> it's very clear though, what is good news is that it's very clear today that we can end new HIV transmissions in this country if the government is willing to back in our community's extraordinary efforts. Uh, and thank you very much, Senator Wong, for uh, that announcement about restoring the funding to Afeo and Napua. Um, Agenda 2025 is a consensus developed by communities, by researchers, by clinicians to end new HIV transmissions in Australia. All your parties, all three of them, attended the launch at Parliament House in June last year, and I was very fortunate to be there as well for that. And when I was there, I was reminded of the very long history of non-partisanship, not just bipartisanship, but non-partisanship when it comes to ending the HIV epidemic. And I think there's a lot to learn there uh, about other issues affecting our communities. Um, the investment we need to end new HIV transmissions in this country and to drastically improve the lives of people living with HIV is $41 million a year. 
uh, a lot of money to this side of the room, uh, but for the people here on this side, you understand maybe not so much, pretty trivial, uh, given the cost that our communities living with HIV and impacted by HIV continue to bear. So my long-winded question is what commitments are your parties offering to end new HIV transmissions to improve the quality of life of people living with HIV, reduce HIV stigma through Agenda 2025? Thank you. Senator Bragg. Oh, thanks, Nick, very much for that question. And uh, I think, as you know, the, the stats are heading in the right direction uh, in terms of the level of new infection since... 2016, I think, is down by 37%. So Australia was one of the first countries to list uh, PrEP uh, on the PBS or equivalent system uh, that was done by uh, by our government. And there's been an ongoing investment into uh, bloodborne viruses as well uh, along the way. So I think there has been a significant effort to try and uh, address HIV uh, under the government. That's uh, it's currently in office, and I think the, the stats speak for themselves. So, uh, but you know, we're always open-minded about any other ways or approaches that we could uh, get down to, to zero, as you're as you're advocating. Senator Wong, thank you. Uh, well, yes, uh, you're right. It's been a, an extraordinary. Uh, it's true, non-partisan, but it was fundamentally bipartisan. Uh, you know, decades ago, uh, and a really good thing. Um, I wonder sometimes if the polity would be capable of doing that now. I hope it could be. Uh, and the community, part of, as you correctly identified, part of the success of um, how we have dealt with the HIV epidemic has been the community-led healthcare and responses. Um, yeah. And I, I was briefed, I think I was in lockdown, about um, Agenda 2025. Um, uh, obviously, the restoration of funding uh, is the first part. We will also, as a down payment, fund a pilot to develop models for... You can tell I'm a foreign shadow, not a <laughs> health shadow. Uh, develop models for peer-led contact tracing and wrap around clinical and peer support at diagnosis, which I think is also proposed in the Agenda 2025 um, plan uh, uh, and a ministerial task force to drive progress towards ending HIV transmission because I think there's, I think it's raised when I, there was a discussion with me that part of the issue is actually, surprise, surprise, uh, administrative bureaucratic bottlenecks and so forth. So hopefully we can, uh, we, we, I'm not announcing the 41, but I hope that um, those things can drive um, that agenda further. And congratulations on all your work. And I'm glad you're here. Yes, we're all glad you're here. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. Absolutely glad you're here. And I was really pleased to go to the Agenda 2025 launch. The thing that struck me from that launch was what a small amount of money to end HIV transmission in Australia. It is a tiny amount. I mean, it's less, considerably less than the subsidies that we give to coal and gas companies, you know, for exploiting fossil fuels. So the Greens would absolutely commit to fund Agenda 2025 in full. Thank you. OK. Sarah Bowman um, will ask our next question. Hi. Excuse me. <clears throat> My name's Sarah Bowman. I'm the Deputy Chair for LGBTIQ Plus Health Australia. Many LGBTI older people have experienced discrimination, stigma and violence throughout their lives. They often need to hide their gender, sexuality, or bodily diversity when accessing aged care. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety found that responding to diversity needs to be a core business for aged care services. What will your party do to ensure LGBTI seniors can access safe and culturally appropriate aged care services? Thank you. Senator Wong. Well, I think uh, as a reminder of what you can do in government, I think it was the last Labor government uh, which both released a, released a national strategy aimed at ensuring uh, ageing LGBTIQ Australians are well cared for. We introduced legislation to protect LGBTIQ plus Australians from discrimination in accessing aged care services, and I remember the discussion about that internally. 
uh, and we remain committed to the full and discrimination free uh, full at dis and dis discrimination free access to aged care services for our community. But it is in the context. I'm just going to say something about aged care, of uh, an aged care sector which is. <laughs> yeah, I think it is um, an extraordinary indictment on our on us, our community, that we can have uh, the sorts of levels or lack of care of um, older Australians that has been documented in uh, the Royal Commission Interim Report. Uh, and we are committed as a government to doing, if we're elected, uh, to putting nurses into um, um, aged care facilities, to making sure we have funded the number of minutes of care that is required, improving food. Um, you know, these are all things that really, we, we are at 2022, we will actually not be having this discussion anymore. Senator Bragg. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I mean, as has been canvassed, the Aged Care Royal Commission has led to a number of new policy initiatives and new funding. Uh, we are going to specifically put $14 million into fund organisations to advocate for particular outcomes. Uh, one of those will be uh, LA, LHA, which will get some funding uh, in relation to these aged care matters so that they can, it can be done in a culturally appropriate way. And uh, again, I think the whole idea of more community-based and community-controlled organisations being able to advocate for community and having a seat at the table is highly desirable. I mean, frankly, that's a that's a principle that goes across the board, I think. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for your, your question. Senator Rice. Fundamentally, we've got to be funding aged care appropriately. And the Royal Commission identified that it was about an extra $6 billion a year that was needed to fund aged care appropriately, which is what we... Six billion, I think, over the, the forwards, which is what we have committed to fund. And again, if you're, you know, basically the money needs to be spent, and that means actually being able to then have quality services and paying aged care workers properly and making sure that there's also appropriate training for those aged care workers. Currently, aged care is operating, you know, with poorly trained workers who often um, and, and poorly paid workers really poor conditions and so you just you cannot um, guarantee that you're going to have that high quality service in your aged care services. So you fund aged care properly and all sorts of things can happen including appropriate and culturally appropriate care for LGBTIQA plus older people. We would also be supporting the community organisations that are doing you know, good work and other ones in terms of supporting people in aged care through community grants and a $70 million um, grant scheme to enable organisations that are working specifically including the Health Alliance with improving um, the, the culture and the practices and, ex and access to aged care services to do the really good work that they do. Thank you. Paula Gerber is our next person who's going to be asking a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Paula Gerber, I'm a professor of human rights law and I'm also a mum of three beautiful children in a rainbow family. And I have to say that filling out the census last year was pretty uncomfortable. Um, I was... <laughs> Thank you. I was asked to name the children's father. Impossible question given they have two mums and were conceived with an anonymous donor. And I was asked lots of very personal questions about my income, about my health, but I couldn't identify as a lesbian and I couldn't identify if my children were trans or, or intersex. In 2021, um, uh, we didn't have the opportunity of recording sexual orientation, gender identity, variations in sex characteristics. And this is really important data. As a researcher, I know the importance of having this sort of information to inform evidence-based reform and advocacy. So my question to the panel is, will you commit in 2026 to having a census that is inclusive of everyone and counts people like me? Thanks, Paula. I reckon that's a really easy 
question that deserves a very short answer from everyone. <laughs> Senator Ross. I could say, just say yes. And actually, when I filled out the census, I immediately wrote off an email to say exactly the sort of things that you've been saying, Paula. It just really infuriated me. So, yes. And, and basically, we've also got um, the government guidelines on recognition of sex and gender, which were meant to have been in place, I can't remember how many years ago. I still have been going to estimates sort of saying, when are the various departments going to be implementing the government guidelines on sex and gender? Because as you say, we need this data and we need people to be acknowledged and you know, counted properly in all of our um, data collection. Well, data creates policy. You, yeah. Um, Senator Wong? Yeah, I think, uh, well, Stephen Jones, I think, wrote uh, in 2019, would that be right? Asking the government to do this. Um, for some reason, Michael Suka said no. Cue you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Senator Andrew the Bragg, would you like you. to see some these questions asked in the census? Well, I don't know why you would be against having more data. Uh, so I think it's an emin eminently sensible idea that we would collect this data. <laughs> and I note that the ABS has now developed a, a sex and gender standard. So I'm sure in the next census uh, we'll be able to cover this additional ground, which is very important. New 26, yeah. I mean, I suppose it is a no-brainer, isn't it, Senator Bragg? You're right. Um, yeah. my, mm -hmm. For years I've well, written about policy and policy relies on having the statistics mm -hmm. to be able to design the policy. Um, uh, but there was some reluctance clearly in the last one. So I suppose the big question I want to ask all of you is, mm -hmm. you know... You don't, want, you don't want that to happen again, right? Um, what can you do to guarantee that it's the case? <laughs> Senator Bragg. Well, I didn't run the last census. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'll be the minister for the census in the future. But what I can say is I think that there's been a very strong case made. Um, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't collect this information. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. And um, I, will, I will even, you know, personally write... Uh, to ensure that we get that that done, because I think, and look, it's potentially something that we could do on a bipartisan basis. I mean, I'm sure we could all agree it's a reasonable, reasonable idea. See, you, you laughed at my question, and now he's writing a letter because I asked yeah. the question. I'll, I'll write it down. Now. I'm <laughs> going to do it. Guarantee. The Carvelis guarantee has been delivered. He's going to write a letter. Um, no, no, so I always follow. I always follow through. It's you important. you do, and you are very passionate about these issues, uh, Senator Wong. Um, well, let's go to our last question, which is not from you, which is from Janet Jukes. Do you want to ask a question of yourself? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, Janet Jukes, I'm the president of the Victorian AIDS Council Gay Men's Health Centre that's known as Thorn Harbour Health. Um, Australia has a small but very impressive uh, group of LGBTIQ community controlled health providers, including the network of AIDS councils who've evolved over 40 years to provide a wide range of primary health services for LGBTIQ communities. Unfortunately, most of us survive on insecure grant funding or funding that's tied to bloodborne viruses, and we've already talked about some of the successes in that area. And that means that we are not necessarily secure for the future, but incredibly needed. There is an opportunity for a visionary government, or maybe even a bipartisan um, arrangements, to work with our organisations to transition to more sustainable services for our communities through supporting us um, to access the MBS and other Commonwealth funding sources. What actions will your party take to support AIDS councils and other LGBTIQ health, commu community health providers in meeting community demand for LGBTIQ-led primary health care services. Senator Rice. Um, we absolutely recognise the importance of funding community-controlled um, health care as being the best um, organisations to be providing that health care um, and have committed as part of our platform a $70 million grants fund over four years for LGBTIQA plus community controlled health organisations and clearly our health and wellbeing plan as well would um, involve the work of and, and actively work with those community controlled health organisations to make sure that you are on a very sound footing so they can continue to do the amazing work that you do. Um. Obviously, we've announced some funding tonight. Um, I'm interested in your 
Well, you flagged MBS. Y- yeah, I, I know. Thank you. That I do know. <laughs> uh, that I do know. Health <laughs> you need you need someone in the health portfolio. I'm very happy to talk about Solomon Islands. <laughs> I've got some questions on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we I uh, did uh, did you? Yeah, didn't I? <laughs> didn't I do that? Organ- didn't I? We <laughs> wrong day. Um, so the, that that will, that is something I'll speak to Mark about because that is a way actually rather than having and I'll be frank, there's a lot of asks for funding from different organisations within our community, particular organisations. But uh, I think it'd be useful to think through what additional MBS entitlement there might be. Um, I take your point about, and it's a common, it's a common criticism or. or issue raised in community organisations across the board because government funding is always so generally short term and so it's very difficult for people to um, both manage financially but also manage in terms of the sort of leadership of the organisation. In fact, people, and I'm sure you and others do a very, very good job in those circumstances. So, but I'll raise that with Mark. Yeah. Can, I'll just ask, okay because you want to break with convention and I love it when people do that. <laughs> so I want to reward that kind of behaviour. And we, we don't like playing by the rules. No. We run a, um, a primary health clinic upstairs yeah. in this building. Yeah, I, th- I understood, um, um, understood which that. Is a met, which, yeah. which is a um, bulk build clinic. And I guess the follow-up <laughs> question is really in relation to... Um, we lose a lot of money on that clinic um, and because we operate a bulk build clinic for people who are disadvantaged, um, particularly people living with HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the challenges, I think, for any community organisation to survive on Medicare funding is that Medicare funding does not cover the cost of delivering those services. Yeah, I understood. But is the ask for capital funding? The ask is for some form of... Well, because obviously if you change the... There's the MBS rate that has broader budget implications... But uh, I think what you're saying is we need we need either capital or operational funding, recurrent funding, to deal with the fact that we are providing a surface to disadvantaged people, so we don't want to go... We want to continue to bulk bill. Agreed. OK, I will certainly raise it with him. Yep. Senator Bragg. Well, look, thanks very much. I mean, I flagged in my earlier comments that we are announcing additional funding for LHA. Now... The question is, uh, what are the additional services that we could fund beyond that? And I think it's really, I put it on to a quality to provide us with some more advice on that uh, because we rely on quality as a, as a peak organisation to give us direct feedback on what we can uh, best best do with the, with the Commonwealth's resources, given that we don't run these services ourselves. We basically out, outsource them. And, uh, and I agree with your statement around community control. I think that's... That's proven uh, to have been very successful, particularly in relation to the management of Indigenous health uh, outcomes during the pandemic. So um, that, I don't think you get any any argument on the principle. The question is uh, where best to put, put the Commonwealth resources. Thank you. Um, I just want to say before I hand over to the wonderful Anna Brown that um, I think the election campaign is a very, very... Uh, often very divisive argumentative space and everyone thinks that I just love them but actually sometimes I find them quite (laughs) fatiguing because of that. But I want to pay tribute to this group because these three senators have kind of been, I think, politicians at their best, respectful to each other but also talking about taking up some of these issues and being collaborators and that is the best of our parliament. So I want to thank you all. I know you all very well and I think that um, you are... Excellent people to come here and answer these questions. I'm Patricia Carvalis. I've done my bit of the night. Anna Brown has more to say. Thank you so much. And I will be very brief because I know we're over time. I just wanted to particularly thank Patricia for donating her time generously for this event. Thank you. And doing such a wonderful job. Um, Thank you to all of you, um, our panellists, for your contributions, your commitments and your continued um, advocacy internally and to the public for our communities. Um, I agree with everything Patricia said. Um, Thank you for your patience with the tech.
and and everyone out there listening online with the tech and the audio. Um, you know, this is community-owned radio at its best, <laughs> and um, we love Joy and we love the Star Observer, and we're really proud to be partnering with both of our community-owned um, um, media media organisations um, for this event. Um, I'd like to also uh, just let people know we're going to send a link around to the video afterwards to everyone that registered. So if you missed out on parts because of the audio, that'll all be resolved. We did have an Auslan interpreter booked, but it's COVID, so hey, <laughs> these things happen. So thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you for, for the individuals who shared their stories and experiences bravely, who asked the tough questions for us on behalf of the community. Thank you. And I'd also like to uh, really acknowledge the uh, organisations that we partnered with for this event. Um, the LGBTI Health Australia, our peak health organisation that do fantastic work, um, it, the Australian Federations, Federation of AIDS organisations and Intersex Human Rights Australia. Um, we, we couldn't have done this um, without such a wonderful partnership. So thank you to all of you for, and all the hardworking staff um, that made this event possible. Thank you, everyone.